this uh, fifth talk of uh, this whole speaker series at the Institute of the Study of International Development. Um, today we're welcoming Angela um, Kronborg Garcia, uh, who is a researcher, um, a research fellow at UC Louvain in Belgium and a research associate at the Institute for, the Social, for Social Research in Africa. She has a PhD from uh, Wageningen University in Holland and a degree in cultural anthropology from Leiden University, also in the Netherlands. Um, Angela studies issues of land use change, political ecology, um, land access, land tenure, and natural resource conflict, among other things, with a focus on emerging land use frontiers. And um, she has carried out in the past long term ethnographic research among the agropastoral Loita Maasai in Kenya for her PhD thesis. And her recent work um, has focused on northern Mozambique, where she studies large scale agricultural and forestry investments. And today she'll talk about that research um, and specifically talk about economies of anticipation in northern uh, Mozambique. So thank you very much, Angela, for being there today. Okay, thank you, Jan, for uh, introducing me and also for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I, will, I, would, I would like to start by giving a little bit of background information. Um, let me see. Yes. Um, the work that I will present here is part of a larger research project called the Midland Research Project, which is a big multidisciplinary project funded by the European Research Council and led by Patrick Meifroy, who is also uh, the co-author of this paper. And by the way, this paper is not yet published, but we hope to finish it up in the next couple of weeks. Um, the Midland Research Project has two main objectives. One is to understand how frontiers emerge by looking at land use change. And the other one is to build on this and advance the theorization of land system science. And for those of you unfamiliar with this field, um, land system science studies the interactions between people and environment through land use. Now, there are many ways in which frontiers can be studied, but our entry point is land use change. And to explain a little bit uh, my understanding of frontiers, I would like to make a distinction between active uh, frontiers and emerging frontiers. Uh, an active frontier is what you would find in the Amazon in South America, where land use is changing very rapidly uh, through agricultural expansion and deforestation. And emerging frontiers are places which have the potential of becoming an active frontier area. So these are places where the rate of land use is still low, but the conditions for frontier emergence have been building up over time. Um, emerging frontiers are typically areas that are used and claimed by local people, but there is an increasing interest from actors, actors with capital to invest, uh, investors, if you wish, um, in commercial land use. So these are also areas where actors of an unequal power interact, where they often compete about land and natural resources and where displacement may happen and where conflict may occur. Um, so in short, active frontiers are about many investors, active expansion, rapid land use change and emerging frontiers are places where all this is about to happen or is starting to happen. Um, because the interest in this research is in understanding how frontiers emerge, uh, my research focuses very much on investors as the main drivers of rapid land use change and in trying to understand why they are investing in these areas and how. This doesn't mean that I'm ignoring other actors in the frontier, like local communities or government actors, but it means that they are my starting point to understand frontier emergence. Now, there are some indications that the Southern African region, and in particular, Northern Mozambique, is an emerging frontier area. So I conducted research in the north of Mozambique, in the provinces of Niassa and Cabo Delgado. And I identified two different emerging frontiers. In Niassa, I found an emerging agriculture frontier. Another paper that I wrote together with Midland colleagues describes how several waves of investors gradually uh, shaped this emerging agriculture frontier. And in Cabo Delgado, there is an emerging extractive frontier. 
both provinces are among the poorest and most marginalized of the country. Um, so let us zoom in a little bit into these two different emerging frontiers. Um, first, Nyasa. Nyasa is often described as the forgotten province of Mozambique because it has been neglected by the government for a long time. It is also the largest province of the country. It has the lowest population density and it, is, it has a, a fertile highland plateau. It is also, um, oh, sorry, not yet ready. It is also being promoted by the government and others as a province with available land. So I found um, this map at FASIM in 2017. FASIM is the annual international fair in Maputo. And this map was uh, located in the Nyasa province stand. And it very clearly targeted uh, potential investors. The map presents uh, Nyasa as a province with plenty of arable land that is available uh, for agricultural investment. So all those green patches are supposedly ready for external or for, for investors, whether foreign or domestic. And now Cabo Delgado. Um, you might have heard about Cabo Delgado because it has been in the news lately. Uh, following an Islamist insurgency in the northeastern part of the province. And it is also an area where natural gas was discovered in 2010 along the coast. And since then, several big companies have been involved in gas exploration. But the province is also rich in other natural resources like graphite, gold, ruby, and other gems and resources. Um, the province has a longer history of small-scale mining, but has recently seen a rush by large-scale miners. So on the right side, the, it's another photo I took at um, Maputo International Fair, and it displays all the mineral resources that are, are available in Cabo Delgado. Again, it's also targeting potential investors. But I also wanted to show this um, screenshot from the Mozambique Mining Cadaster um, portal, because to me it very clearly shows that the province uh, Cabo Delgado is a mining frontier, especially if you compare it with Niasa, which is um, on the uh, to the west of Cabo Delgado. Um, so the, the green parts along the coast, the green blocks are natural gas concession blocks, and all the the blue blocks are exploration exploration licenses and um, the green ones are mining concessions and um, not the big green uh, areas those are natural parks but the smaller more rectangular and and uh, blocks are mining concessions okay methods of field work i did field work in 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 mostly in the, these two provinces, but also I did some interviews in Maputo and a little bit of field work in other provinces in 2017 and in 2018. Um, I conducted interviews, focus group discussions, um, interviews with agriculture and forestry companies, uh, foreign and Mozambican commercial farmers with mining companies, but also with government representatives, NGOs and local farmers. I also did some on-site observations during visits to um, farms, plantations, company offices, and factories. But I also attended many public consultations and public consultations are meetings organized by mining companies that want to acquire land to initiate a new mining operation. And therefore they need to inform and agree with the people who live there about resettlement and compensation. And I find these meetings very interesting because um, they're very useful to study interactions and power relations because they bring together different actors. They bring together the mining company, representatives from the mining company, but also the consultancy company that the mining company hires to do the resettlement plan. Of course, the, the people who live there but it also uh, is often attended by government officials from the district or the provincial and sometimes even the national level and researchers like myself. And sometimes there are also civil society organizations uh, at these meetings. Um, lastly, I also attended a two day national resettlement meeting. 
which was hosted by the Ministry of Land. And it was attended by government institutions, uh, a number of big extractive companies, consultancy companies, and also the World Bank was there. There were a few NGOs, um, some scholars and some community leaders. And the objective of this meeting was to share resettlement experiences, to find solutions to the problems, but it was mainly to revise the resettlement re legislation. So um, while I was doing research on, on land use change and emerging frontiers and talking and listening to people, I noticed that many spoke in terms of uh, dreams and visions of development. They, they talked about the potentiality of the region to become the next breadbasket in Africa or about the expectation of a natural gas boom that would boost the local economy and bring wealth to all. One of the agribusiness companies that I studied was actually called Dream, as you can see on the on the picture, Dream Agrobusiness. Um, but at the same time, other people would express worries about the future. For example, because they feared that local communities would lose their livelihoods as investors would take their land. So I realized that they were all talking about something that was going to happen in the future or rather, some, uh, or rather what they hoped would happen or what they hoped would not happen in the future. So people were really preoccupied with the future. And so I thought it was important to explore this further. Um, Jamie Cross, he is an anthropologist who studied uh, special economic zones in India. And he coined the concept of economies of anticipation. And in many ways, special economic zones are like land use frontiers. And they are spaces targeted by investors of rapid transformation and spaces of displacement and resettlement. And I find this concept very useful to understand what is happening in Northern Mozambique. An, an economy of anticipation is about uh, diverse ways in which people orient themselves towards the future, but also about how these different orientations to the future become entangled and clash or align. So this focus on orientations to the future or futural orientations, as some have called them, is part of a new and development subfield in anthropology called the anthropology of the future. And uh, futural orientations are potentiality, speculation, expectation, hope, dreams, visions, but also their opposites like hopelessness, resignation, fear, and uncertainty. But I would like to focus on anticipation. There is quite some literature out there on anticipation. But there are two things that I would like to stress here. The first one is that anticipation is different from expectation. Anticipation is about expecting something, but also about doing something now about that expectation. And the second um, thing I want to emphasize about anticipation is that it has an affective dimension meaning that it goes together with emotions, moods and intuitions, and particularly uh, hope and fear. So this is where I would like to link up these ideas about anticipation with questions of land use change. Um, uh, I'm interested to explore if and how futural orientation, orientations like speculation, dreams, visions, hope, uh, influence land use decisions and land use practices, and how this produces an economy of anticipation, and also how this economy of anticipation contributes to land use change and frontier emergence. Now, because of uh, our particular interest in emerging frontiers, the, the actor that I'm going to use as an entry point to explore how anticipation influences land use change is the pioneer. And then I will then explore other anticipations as I trace the relations and interactions of pioneers with uh, other actors in the frontier. 
So for the emerging agriculture frontier in Nyasa, I will focus on what we have called missionary far farmers. I will come back to them later. Uh, and for the emerging extractive frontier in Cabo Delgado, I will focus on the junior graphite mining companies. Um, junior mining companies are like the pioneers of extractive frontiers. They are small companies and focus on exploration. They're also big risk takers. And if they succeed in discovering resources, they set up the basic infrastructure and secure the necessary licenses and are then usually bought out by more senior uh, mining companies, which are larger and more experienced companies. Or they can attract capital and move into production and become senior mining companies themselves. Okay, graphite. Uh, graphite is a so-called green mineral. It is used in the batteries for mobile phones, for laptops, and for electric cars. Now, electric cars, uh, it, it has, is having a big impact because it's estimated that there will be a huge demand for electric cars in the future. And now that I'm in, in Belgium, I'm seeing electric cars charging almost everywhere and many people are acquiring electric cars. Now, Mozambique has one of the largest deposits of high quality natural graphite in the world. And most of it is found in Cabo Delgado. So there is huge excitement about the potential of graphite mining in Cabo Delgado. And so about 10 years ago, junior mining companies started to rush to the area to drill for graphite. The first graphite mine opened in just very recently in 2018. And there are now between four and five mines in different phases of development. So it's in this context that anticipation comes to expression. For example, um, excitement about graphite was expressed to me by a Mozambican employee of a junior graphite mining company. And uh, as part of his benefit package, he was given shares by the company. And so he showed me this app um, on the left side of the screen. It was an app on his mobile phone and he was constantly checking the, his app uh, during the day. And this app shows the value of the company shares. And he was very optimistic about this. And he was dreaming about all the money that he would have when selling his shares and all he could do with it, like building a house and paying for private education for his children. But he was also very well aware that the company had given him um, these shares as an incentive to do his work well which in his case was to ensure that the land acquisition and resettlement of local communities would run smoothly and without delays. So graphite mining involves the displacement of land users uh, and the resettlement of people. Sometimes um, this only concerns the displacement of agricultural fields, but also sometimes it involves the resettlement of whole villages. And so I mentioned the public consultations earlier. This is one of the public consultations that I attended. And um, well, you can see in the back, uh, there's a, a white person. He, was, he is part of the consultancy company. The other men seated on chairs are government officials. And, um, and from the back, you can see the, the people from the village on the left side. The men are seated and the women are seated on the right side. And at this particular public consultation, local people were informed for the very first time about a, a new mining project. And, they, and they, they were told that they would need to move to make way for this mine. So during this public consultation, several men and women stood up to talk and express, and they actually expressed uh, sadness and fear at hearing this news. So people were very worried about their livelihoods, particularly now that they would lose their land. And I want to illustrate it with some quotes from some of the speakers at this public consultation. Um, one woman who stood up, um, she said, and I quote, today I was at the field when I heard that EPA, this company is moving in. I started crying immediately. I finished planting those peanuts in tears. I thought today will be my last time to cultivate, end quote. 
And another woman at a, a different public consultation said, quote, none of us knows how to do business. None of us knows how to earn money. What we do know is to produce maize, peas, etc. We don't know what to do. What are we going to do? Look at today. Today, I'm just waiting to die. I am waiting to see my son starve to death. I'm waiting to see my grandchildren dying of hunger because what I depended on, and she means the land, will not be there anymore. I depend on getting cassava to cook, end quote. So both these women, they saw no future. It was very uncertain for them. And the last one actually articulated this in terms of dying. But at the same time, others, um, other people from the village spoke of hope, hope of a better life, hope of accessing money and being able to buy a bicycle or a television. But there were particularly hopes of, for jobs. So um, this is another quote by a man at a public consultation. And he said, so I'm thanking the company and I'm still encouraging the company to come. With the arrival of the company, I'm asking that our children, our children have the opportunity to get jobs in this new mine. And another man at a different public consultation said, because one day it might happen that our brother, our, our uncle will be employed in that place. When he gets a job, he can come and build his house here or have a lot of money and employ, him, employ his other family members to wash dishes at his, house, at his house, washing his clothes while he's at work. That's very important. So we see that the news of this new mine was received with mixed feelings, uh, uncertainty about the future, especially because they would lose their farmland, um, but also there was hope for, for jobs. And it was interestingly at a national resettlement meeting, local people's high expectations um, of jobs, especially, was seen as a big problem. And it was discussed, especially by government actors, the mining companies, and the consultants, who were the ones that uh, dominated the national meeting. So people's expectations were seen as unrealistic and impossible for companies to live up to. Um, so much of their discussion on this topic was on how best to manage these expectations. And on the picture, you can see one of the presentations and um, the title just down with expectativas it means management of expectations. So it was an important um, debate at a national resettlement meeting. Okay, moving on to the agriculture frontier of NIASA. Um, the first wave of external actors to arrive to NIASA um, that was after the Civil War ended in 1992 was what we call the missionary farmers. And most of them were white South Africans um, linked to the Dutch Reformed Church, and some of them had a farming background. This is an interesting group because they, didn't, they did not necessarily go to NIASA because of the availability of land like commercial farmers and companies would do later, but because it was an isolated area where people had not heard about God and they wanted to spread Christianity. So these missionary farmers introduced a business style that was family oriented, meaning that the commercial farms um, they set up were family owned and run, which is different from the more corporate and transnational structures of some of the later investments in agriculture and forestry in Yassam. And I'm mentioning, I am mentioning these two different business styles because they are reflected in two different ways of viewing and anticipating um, the future. So the family-oriented commercial farmers, mostly represented by missionary farmers, but also uh, some Christian businessmen that followed in their wake, they, they spoke very passionately about dreams of change and the visions they had of, of better futures. So theirs was a, a, a vision of seeing Nyasa developed through commercial agriculture, but with Christian values and by doing what they called honest business, 
meaning that um, uh, not by corruption, um, honest business, but that would have a broader social impact and was not only focused on, on generating profits. And with their own farms, they tried to set an example so that uh, subsistence farmers would follow them. So for example, they would choose to grow sunflowers rather than tobacco, because although tobacco is more lucrative, it is also harmful for those that cultivate it. Or they would choose to do dairy farming in order to sell yogurt locally, uh, rather than choosing an export crop like macadamia. So on, on the left side is a picture that I took at, um, at the dairy farm of one of the missionary farmers, and he also built a small shop near to the market on the right picture where he sells yogurt um, where he sells yogurt okay um corporate agriculture in yasa so the land use decisions and practices by the more corporate actors they were driven more by calculations and expectations of future markets rather than dreams and visions of, of local development. A number of the agricultural companies I talked to, they explained to me that they expected um, that the natural gas boom in Cabo Delgado, which was not there yet, um, they explained to me that this expectation had influenced some of the, of the decisions they had made because they all anticipated that an expat community would develop along the coast as all these companies would settle there and uh, attract many people. Um, and so they saw opportunities for supplying that expected expat community with high value products that, uh, that were not, that there was not, there was not a, a local market for, this project, for these products, but with this expat community that they hoped would develop, they saw an opportunity. So for example, one company decided to grow coffee, which is something new in the, air, in the area. And another one decided to invest in beef because they thought that they would find a market for these products with the expat community. And beef um, is, is in this region is um, for hotels, is flown in all the way from South Africa. So this farmer saw an opportunity there. Um, but for another agribusiness company, a transnational one, he also, the, the CEO also mentioned that the expat community in Cabo Delgado had been one of the reasons for investing in Nyasa in the first place. So we see how um, actors in Nyasa's emerging uh, agriculture frontier were anticipating something to happen in the graphite in the extractive frontier of Cabo Delgado, and this was influencing their decisions um, about land use. Okay, so what I wanted to do in this presentation was to, to give you a few examples of how in anticipation can influence land use decisions and practices, um, but also how different futural orientations can interact with each other to form an economy of anticipation. So let me first make a number of observa observations regarding Northern Mozambique's economy of anticipation. So it seems that in places where things are not yet, so the resettlement ha still has to happen, develop, markets still have to develop, profits still have to be made and development still has to happen also. So it seems that in these places, anticipation is driving much of what people think and do. But anticipations are also ambivalent. We saw how for local communities, uh, how they are caught between hope and fear. We also see that investors are not homogeneous and this is reflected in their different anticipations. But company employees and subsistence farmers in a way also have similar dreams. They both dream of a better life in the future. But anticipations are also unequal because for some, the way they can imagine the future is limited or it is constrained by webs of power and their position in society. And anticipations also interact 
there are anticipations that interact within frontiers and also across frontiers, as I showed with the last example. Okay, and um, if you remember, one of the objectives in this paper was to explore whether and how anticipation influences land use change. And I hope to have shown that it does. Um, I explained how electric vehicle forecasts and growing graphite dem demand is leading to graphite mining expansion in Cabo Delgado, but also how graphite market speculation and dreams of future riches is leading to land use displacement through resettlement of populations and farmlands. We also saw that there is a lot of fear and uncertainty about the future in the context of resettlement, but also hopes of a better life and expectations of jobs. And we saw that governments, co government actors, companies and consultants are trying to manage these expectations. Um, with the Christian farmers, the missionary farmers and Christian businessmen, we saw that they have dreams and visions of Christian development and it's, it's influencing, um, it's leading to a specific, a specific form of commercial farming. But we also saw how the expectation of an expat community is leading them to, stimulating them to invest in high value agricultural project, products. So to conclude um, with this paper, what we try to, to do is to link two fields of study, uh, the anthropology of the future and land system science. Uh, in order to show how an economy of anticipation can shape land use change. And also by focusing on pioneers, how this may contribute to frontier emergence. Thank you very much.